Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Guys, can you see my screen? Give me you have to give me a thumbs up. Yeah. Awesome. Let me move this somewhere else. Okay, so welcome to the Elite Training webinar. Um, for those who are joining for the very first time, uh, we try to do these webinars at least at the start of every single cycle. I think our goal is to do a little bit more of them. The objective of the webinar is to meet a lot of you guys. Uh, you know, a lot of you guys are a part of the process programming and we only ever see your Instagram profiles or of course your scores coming through on what up or you chirping up on the uh, water cooler, which is great. Don't get me wrong, but it's always nice to actually see your faces and have a chance to have a conversation and connect with you. So that's one objective. Uh, another objective is for those who are already a part of the process programming, just to kind of give you guys some reminders on what we're doing at this point in the season. Uh, what we should be focusing on. And of course, we will touch on what we have coming up in the next training cycle. Uh, but we also have uh, lots of people who are joining us um, from afar uh, who are not currently part of the process, who are here perhaps just to learn about what we do, hopefully pick up a few things in terms of uh, you know what you guys could be doing wherever you are and whatever program you're following, whichever coach you're working with, uh, that can help you move the needle towards your goals. So I think just a bit of context for this call, uh, we're talking about, uh, we're talking really to coaches and athletes. Oh, still have people jumping in. We're speaking to coaches and athletes who have the goal to be performing at their very best in the quarterfinals, the semifinals, and the CrossFit Games. Uh, that's what we're talking about today. Tomorrow, we will be doing another call uh, talking about the Live, Perform, Compete cycle. So that will be specifically for people who are in the Compete program trying to peak for the quarterfinals, uh, but for the perform program, trying to peak for the open. So if you guys would also like to be a part of that call, we'd love you guys to join us. If you have friends, family, people in your gym, who you might think would benefit from that call because it aligns to their goals. Then of course, we absolutely welcome them as well. Um, we'll be sending out some stuff on social media about the links and all that kind of stuff. So are we all good guys? Unfortunately, there's loads of you on the call, but because I'm doing a share screen, I can only see Ant, Mav, Karan, Josh, and Florence. So I'm relying on you guys to, to, to prompt me if I need to. Uh, if you guys do have any questions as I'm going along, um, definitely want to open up to have a chance to have a chat at the end of this call. Uh, so you can just pop your questions in the, uh, in the what's it called, in the chat box. Uh, I don't know if you know, but if you hold your hand up for X number of seconds, Zoom will say that you have raised your hand. Actually, that doesn't seem to be working right now. But anyway, we're just letting that on my last call. Okay, let's crack on. Here's what we have today. Uh, we're going to start by just talking about the 2023-2024 season, the roadmap. Now, this roadmap is what we're going to be following at the process programming. Uh, with roadmaps, I mean, there are thousands of ways, thousands of ways to skin the cat and achieve the same result. So we're just going to share what we're going to be doing this season. Uh, we're going to talk about what an intensification cycle is, because that's what we're about to start, uh, having just finished a 12-week accumulation cycle. We'll talk about what we should be prioritizing at this point in the season, movements we should be preparing for, how to work on your weaknesses following a group program. We will touch on the next cycle. I won't go into that too deep, uh, because for those who are a part of the process, uh, I've just spammed the shit out of you today with loads of information about what the next cycle looks like. Sweet. Um, we'll talk about ma making adjustments to the program. Josh. I think this is something that is a really important conversation we need to have because uh, I do think that people often follow programs a little bit blindly and that's not something that I would recommend. So I'd like to talk about that. And then we'll talk about at the end, talk about self-awareness and things like training environment. How important is it? Let's move on. Uh, someone has not muted themselves and I have no idea who it is, but if you have not muted yourselves, guys, uh, it's not that I don't want to hear you talking, but it's just that. Ah, oh, Skulk, you are Mr. Zero for Ian. Of course it's you. And Mika, hello, welcome. Um, okay, let's do this. Okay, let's talk about the roadmap that we have set out for this year. Uh, so really, compete elite athletes. Remember, we're talking about 
preparing for the quarterfinals and the cross at semifinals in the games. So what we have just finished, we have just finished a 12 week accumulation cycle. So our goal in the last 12 weeks for our compete and elite cycles was to get strong, develop skills, build our aerobic base. Now, we're well aware that for the athletes who competed in the semifinals, which is quite a few of you on this call, uh, you will have missed a lot of this cycle. Uh, and what I will say is don't fret. Uh, just because you've missed it does not mean it is too late. It does not mean that you've missed your opportunity to get strong. When I actually outline the rest of the season, you'll see there's plenty more opportunities to do it. But basically, we've just been focusing on really developing absolute strength here. We are entering this phase here. So we're moving into a six-week intensification cycle. We'll talk about what that means a little bit later. After the six weeks, we're going to move into the process summer throwdown. Uh, now, that is not mandatory, um, but it is an online competition that we're going to be hosting. Uh, it runs uh, the same way that the... How do I go back? Oh, shit. Sorry. It runs the same way the CrossFit Open does every Saturday. Uh, we're going to do a workout for three weeks. There'll be two workouts each Saturday. Uh, we're going to run multiple divisions. Should be a lot of fun. Um, so we're basically throwing in the competition kind of at the end of summer. We do this every year because what we do find is that if we're not doing competitions and we're just saving competing to the very end of the season when the open rolls around, a lot of us lose touch with the art of competing. So if you are doing things like qualifiers and you're thinking, you know what, I don't really want to be doing an online competition at this point in the year, that's not a problem at all. <clears throat> You'll just see this six-week intensification cycle kind of spread over to more like a nine-week intensification cycle. So we will still be training throughout this three weeks, still working on our priorities. It's just what you will see is that every Saturday, instead of our Saturday tester, which we do all the time anyway, we'll be doing a competition workout. Once we finish this nine weeks, we're going back into a 12-week accumulation phase, similar to what we just did at the start of season. So we're going to kind of pull back intensity a little bit, and we're going to focus on getting stronger again, isolating some skills in isolation and under fatigue. Uh, we're probably going to break up this 12 weeks into kind of like two six-week blocks. Moving on, once we've done that, I'm just taking you guys through the whole year, we'll move back into an intensification cycle. And then we're basically moving into the open. It's pretty crazy how fast that rolls around every year. Uh, so once we finish that, we then go into a competition prep phase. And then, of course, the CrossFit Open starts. And then once the CrossFit Open is done, we have the quarterfinals. If those who progress on for the quarterfinals, we then, of course, move into the semifinals. Now, I think an important distinguish a distinction to make now is what is your goal this season? If your goal is to make it to the quarterfinals, and that is something that is not a complete guarantee for you, then what we're going to be doing is we're going to be peaking for the open. What that means is like we need to be, we need to be fit and pretty close to being at our fittest when the open rolls around in order to qualify for the quarterfinals. Now, if your goal is uh, to perform well in the quarterfinals, what we mean by that is is you know that you're pretty guaranteed, pretty much guaranteed to finish within the top 10% of your age group or within your within your continent, um, then we're not going to be peaking for the Open. Instead, what we'll use, we'll use the Open as just another training phase. We'll train hard throughout the Open, obviously do the Open workouts, hopefully just once. That's the goal, not doing repeat attempts. And then we want to be at our best for the quarterfinals. If your goal is, in fact, the semifinals, you're probably going to sit within one or two categories. You're either going to be a very high level semifinal athlete. What I mean by that is that you're almost guaranteed to make it. I don't think there's too many people who exist in the world these days who are a guaranteed to semifinals just because it's getting so competitive. Or you're going to be someone who's trying to get to semifinals, but is definitely not guaranteed. So if you are the latter, you're someone who's trying to qualify for the semifinals, but you know you're going to have to fight tooth and nail to get there well, then you guys are going to be peaking for the quarterfinals. That means you need to be at your very best mentally and physically for the quarterfinals. And if you make it fantastic, we'll just run another, a second peaking cycle. If you are the former, you're someone who is a high level semifinal athlete who's almost guaranteed to get there, then we won't be stressing too much about the quarterfinals. We want to focus on being at our very best at the semifinals. <coughs> Excuse me. Does that make sense, everyone? Yes, just swallowed some saliva. Two secs. 
Okay, great. Let's move on. <clears throat> Let's just talk about two terms that I've been using a lot already. The first term is peaking. What does that mean? <clears throat> what peaking means in my eyes, it means that you are picking a point in the season or a point in the year where you need to be at your physical and mental best. Now, truth be told, when it comes to peaking, we cannot really be choosing multiple times to peak within a 12-month year. Ooh. For most athletes, there's going to be one time that we need to be at our very best for. So that would be what we would call like the main peak. Now, you can run things like mini peaks, which basically means you kind of like, you're going to be at not quite at your very best, but you're going to be good. And I think that's something we have to accept. I think athletes don't accept that point enough. And what they do, they make one or two mistakes. They try to pick too many things that they're peaking for because you know to peak for something is going to require multiple training phases in the lead up where you're pushing really, really hard and you're training a simulating competition. So one mistake people make is that they peak for too many things. And by the time they get to the end of the season, they just burn out and they have nothing to give. Or athletes make the mistake of just being peaked all year round. Uh, so a lot of athletes will make the mistake of just training like a CrossFit Games athlete all year round. And that's fantastic, but you cannot sustain that all year round. We know that competition level intensity requires us to give another gear. And we want to be getting to the peaking part of our year, quarterfinals or the semifinals or the open, and being able to give another gear. So if you've ever experienced in a past where you've come to competition time and you just don't have another gear to give, you feel like you're just pushing hard and you just got nothing. You're feeling injured. You're feeling broken. You're feeling mentally burnt out. I can see some people looking at me nodding their heads like, yep. Um, then the likelihood is you haven't, you, you haven't managed your season effectively. Now that doesn't always come down to the program. I just want to say that as well. Uh, it really comes down to a combination of both the program but also your intention as an athlete and how you execute that program. Does that make sense, guys? So what you can have, you can have a program that is written to be slightly lower in intensity, uh, but you could be doing two things. You could be hitting that program too hard and you could be not recovering enough. So you're not doing enough in your lifestyle outside of the gym that you can't handle the volume and intensity inside of it. Okay, so just bear that in mind. Our goal on the process programming and the elite program is to be at our best in the quarterfinals and the semifinals. So a question I often get asked is, well, what does that mean if I want to do competitions mid-year? Well, the, my answer always is you can definitely do competitions mid-year. That's not a problem. And I actually highly encourage it because we need to be practicing the skill competing all the time. However, you need to accept that you're not going to be at your physical and mental best. You just need to accept that. So a lot of athletes will compete mid-season where they're following a program where the goal is to peak at the end of the season and they'll say, ah, oh, I just didn't feel fit, didn't feel strong, didn't feel my best. Yes, that's ex exactly how you should feel, right? Because if you're feeling at your very best midway through the year, it probably means you haven't peaked correctly. Okay, let's move on to the next point. What does intensification mean? We've just finished an accumulation accumulation cycle, and now we move into intensification. So when you look at that roadmap that I just showed you guys, we're kind of always spending time flip-flopping between those two phases, accumulation and intensification. There are two more phases that we refer to in programming. One is called a pre-competition phase. That is the phase just before you enter a competition. And the other one is a competition phase. That's when you're in competition. <clears throat> so when we talk about intensification, what we're really saying is that an intensification phase is more intense relative to the accumulation phase. That's the easiest way to look at it. But there are a few principles that apply here. So in the accumulation phases, generally we're doing a bit more kind of like hypertrophy or higher end, uh, higher repetition strength work. We might be isolating a lot of our skills. We might be doing a lot more interval-based work. Our energy system training or our Metcons might be a little bit lower in intensity. And then when we talk about intensification, we're talking the opposite end to all those. So higher intensity, shorter, faster Metcons, taking our high skill movements and putting them into a fatigue-based setting, uh, working top end strength, potentially. A really simple way to put it is that accumulation phases, our training looks less like the sport. Intensification phases, our training looks more like the sport. 
Okay, so definitely when we talk about intensification in terms of CrossFit, we are going to assume that this is going to be a training phase that's going to be a little bit more taxing on the body. It's going to be a little bit more taxing on the nervous system. Uh, so when we enter intensification phases, it's really important that we have to step up our game in all other aspects of life. So that means making sure you're dialing in sleep, you're making sure you're you're managing stress better, making sure you're getting enough food, making sure you making sure you're enjoying the training process. All those things are really really important if you're going to get the most out of an intensification phase. Now, one last thing of this is that you will notice when we when we break up the year we generally spend more time in accumulation work and a bit less time in intensification work. So if you look at what we've just done, 12 weeks in accumulation, and then we're going into six weeks of intensification. Then we go back to 12 weeks of accumulation. Then we go into seven weeks of intensification. And that is specifically done to make sure we're managing the longevity of our athletes. Why is this important? Well, mistakes that some athletes made, and I've made this mistake as an athlete, and I've also made this mistake as a coach, is spending too much time in accumulation. So a lot of people will finish a season, they'll kind of list down their 10 priorities, their 10 weaknesses that they really need to work on. And they just hammer home those weaknesses all year. And the way they do that is they kind of isolate the movements and they just repeat, 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 repeat. Whilst that is really good, and you can definitely make progress with that, you have to remember that if you want to get better at the sport of CrossFit, you need to do the sport of CrossFit. So what that means is you can't always just do EMOMs. You can't always just isolate movements. Sometimes you've got to do 2159s, rounds for times, and rounds where you're pushing hard, uh, trying to get the best time possible, right? So we're just flip-flopping between those two things all year round. All good? Thumbs up? Lovely. Okay, let's move on. Whoa, sorry, sometimes it does. Okay, what should I prioritize at this point in the year? Okay, few general things to think about. Number one, health. This is not the time of the year where we want to be running into ill health related to training. I'm not talking about health that you might pick up completely not related to training, uh, but generally we also do know that a lot of athletes will pick up health issues because of the way that they apply themselves in the gym. So what I mean by that is that they just go a little bit too hard where we know we're running down the immune system and we're doing that constantly and that's when our body gets sick. So a really good um, marker of health is the fact that right now we should be picking up less injuries and picking up less illnesses, having hopefully less mental health uh, related issues. Okay, so that's something we want to prioritize. Now, the reason I say that, and I know that sounds really self-explanatory, yeah, of course, I, why would I want to be injured and why would I not want to be healthy, Ed? Well, in an intensification phase or in a pre-competition and a competition phase, this is when the likelihood of injury and health issues is going to be higher. Because in a pre-comp and a competition phase, you are pushing your body hard. And what I will say is that in those periods of training, those are the periods of times where you kind of got to grit your teeth and just get through it. Okay. In a pre-comp and a competition phase, we're not trying to prioritize health. We're trying to prioritize performance. But at this point in the year, really far out from competition, I would say I would lean towards more on the end of health versus performance. Injury-free, same thing. Now, the reason I wrote size, question mark, was if you are an athlete who perhaps struggles with strength, and that is something that holds you back in the sport, this might be a really good time of year to actually think about putting on some size. Uh, size will obviously mean muscle mass, but that also might mean fat mass as well. Now, I actually see this as a good thing, especially from a health perspective. You know, having a bit more fat mass in the body kind of gives you more of a buffer to tolerate intensity. Okay. And also, we do know that mass moves mass. So if your goal is to get strong, you know, having being a little bit heavier, carrying a few extra pounds is actually going to help you potentially make strength gains. And I'm not talking about bulking phases. I'm not talk, talking about doing dirty bulks here where you just eat shit food and get really, really big. Uh, and, you know, squat a bunch of weight, but everything else falls to wayside. I'm talking about, you know, small increments in weight and size. This might be a good time of year to do it, not only from a performance basis, from a performance standpoint, but also a health standpoint. Lastly, this is a fantastic time of the year to be focusing on prioritizing technique, efficiency, and positions. Now, the reason I really emphasize these things, especially to elite athletes, 
is pretty much everyone on this call is already really good at every movement in the sport. But there's a difference between being really good at a movement and being elite at a movement. And I do think this is a mistake or a trap that a lot of us fall into is we think, well, I can already do a double under. Like, why do I need to work on improving my double unders? And so rather than improving the efficiency and the technique of the double under, we just do more double unders. So rather than doing 50 in a workout, we bump it up to 100, then 200, then 300, then 500. Now, great, that's going to improve your tolerance to volume. And that is important in the sport with some things. But just remember, if you can improve your technique and efficiency in a movement, that means that you are burning less energy per repetition. And that 100% should be within our interest. If you're burning less energy per repetition, that means that you can finish workouts faster by not having to be any fitter. Does that make sense? And I do really think that is something that elite athletes at our levels need to think about. It shouldn't just always be about go faster, go harder, do more volume. Instead, put every single movement in the sport under a microscope and ask yourself, how can I improve technique and efficiency? Of course, that's why we have our premium subscription, you know, where we have um, we have coaches who can kind of help you along that journey and help guide you and find out, you know, what you need to focus on. Thumbs up. All good. Okay, let's talk about some things we've learned from this year. Movements which we are confident. Oh, that doesn't even make sense. Movements which are confident will show up next year. You know what I meant. Okay, so first thing to, to remember is that the CrossFit Games and what is programmed at the Games, when I say the Games, I'm talking about the quarterfinals, the Open, semifinals, and the CrossFit Games. That will always influence the testing that we see in the sport. And what I mean by that is often even small local competitions will see what's being tested by HQ and those movements will be will dictate or heavily bias, I would say, what we're probably going to see in competitions. So if you're someone who's even just thinking about taking part in local competitions, always look at what's being programmed at the top and make sure you're covering your bases and your training. So a few things that I think we need to be working on this year is running for sure. Uh, you know, I've listened to lots of Adrian Bosman podcasts. He's a big believer in running. He thinks it's a fantastic way to express aerobic capacity. We saw it a lot in the semifinals. You know, three of the tests out of seven had running in it. So if you are not a proficient runner, this is a great time in the year to be focusing on your running. Okay, that's not just running volume. That's not just running intensity. I'll go back to what I just said there. It's also your running technique. So if you're a poor technical runner, now is a great time to be working on improving that technique and, of course, increasing things like volume and intensity. Shuttles, assault runners, and outdoor stuff. Handstand complexity. We've seen that. Um, we've seen big step-ups in what's been tested now. We obviously saw in handstand push-ups. We saw the chest wall handstand push-up come up. Who knows? We might see things like freestanding handstand push-ups. But I do think that things like the pirouettes, press to handstands, which we've seen in the last couple of years, are going to be mainstays in the sport. So it's not just about walking in a straight line anymore. It's not just about doing handstand push-ups. We need to be working on things like freestand handstand push-ups, freestand handstands, handstand walking of all variations. So for those who've been following the Elite program, that's why we have so much of that in the program. I know it's boring. I know it's repetitive, but I think these are really important skills that you need to hone in. Kettlebells, that was on the equipment list last year. Uh, but we didn't see it. We didn't see him show up. So I do think we're probably going to see kettlebells in the open quarterfinals and semifinals next year. Legless rope climbs. I mean, that's not something new, but we have seen new variations of it. Uh, and we have also seen that the seated legless rope climb bottlenecked a lot of athletes uh, at the semifinals. Uh, so I think there's a good chance that the legless rope climb could make its way into things like the quarterfinals. So if you are proficient with them, fantastic. But I do think the gold standard is going to be able to perform multiple reps from a seated position where you're doing legless on the way up and you're doing legless on the way down. Uh, so make sure you're addressing that in your training. The chest hands handstand push-up, of course, talk to that. Um, I would say don't just get used to doing your head to a mat uh, on a flat surface. You need to be playing with things like deficits. You need to be playing with different standards. I would say that is just something to remember is that the standards of the sport are changing a lot. Something like a handstand push-up. We've seen the standards of handstand push-ups change every single year. This is the first year we've seen a line. We've had boxes. We've had forearm measurements. 
All that to say is that don't get too comfortable or too used to any one standard. And that goes for every single movement. So sometimes in a program, we will put that specifically in the notes to try a different standard. But otherwise, I encourage you guys as high performing athletes to challenge yourself with different standards. All right. Don't just get used to the same thing all the time. And then I think what we saw the semifinals, the kind of toes to ring, uh, ring muscle up complex. Uh, I think we're going to see more gymnastics complexes. I think elite athletes now are all very good at toes to bar. We're all very good at chest to bars. We're all good at bar muscle ups. So now finding combinations and testing combinations of those movements might be something that we should start to see in the sport. So this all comes under the idea of virtuosity, which is what, you know, one of CrossFit's, um, you know, main principles, which is, you know, thinking outside the box um, and challenging movements in their various forms. And I think that's something really important uh, for us to do if we want to be competitors in the sport or coaches in the sport because uh, that's something I know that Adrian Bosman really really likes about CrossFit just challenging virtuosity okay <clears throat> uh, moving on so here's a great question that we get asked all the time is how do I work on my weaknesses if I follow a group program so the programs that we prescribe at the process, you know, specifically talking about the Compete and Elite program, they are group programs. So all of our members, our subscribers are following the same program. So a few things that we do to try and help people actually focus on the things they need to work on more is number one, we have accessory programs. Uh, so we have a gymnastics accessory program. We have an endurance accessory program and we have an Olympic lifting accessory program. We also have kind of like a functional bodybuilding accessory program. So if you're someone who feels a bit broken, beaten up, uh, feels like they're lack lacking structural balance or just wants to develop a bit of size, that would probably be the best option for you. So we give you guys the ability to be able to add those things should you need it into your program. Um, otherwise, you know, the way that the program is written is that we're always going to be kind of addressing bits of everything, but we're breaking up the year to go, really in detail on certain things that's how it works right we're not trying to improve everything all the time because we know if you're trying to improve everything all the time that progress is going to be very very slow instead what we do we pick these cycles like we're about to go into we go a little bit more focus on a few things try to get those things really really good while everything goes into maintenance mode we go into our next cycle we focus on the next batch of things and then the next batch of things and the next batch of things so that's how we kind of structure our training year and of course if you have no idea how the hell to work on your weaknesses or what your weaknesses are, of course, have a coach guide you. Uh, that's why we actually created the premium subscription here. Uh, we know that a lot of athletes, it's not just about the program. They want accountability. They want to have a relationship with a coach. They want an extra set of eyes on them reviewing all the videos they upload. And they just want a coach to basically critique them and find out what their weaknesses are and how they can actually work on them. I talked about this already with regards to intensification phases you actually have to do the sport. So we can't just isolate things forever. There has to be a point in time where our weaknesses that we've been isolating get thrown into things like AMRAPs, rounds for times, 2159s, uh, you know, because this whole sport is all about experience. It's like you need to experience every single movement and every single possible combination, reflect and learn from it. And that's how we get good at competing in it. Last little point here is we need to identify what the foundations of your weaknesses are and now is a great time to work on those things. So if you're someone who says, okay, I need to get stronger. When I say I need to get stronger, that means relative to your competitors. I'm sure every single human being wants to be stronger. But if you are already a monster and you're outlifting everyone and you're winning the strength events and competitions and you're saying I need to get stronger, well, maybe that's not actually what you need relative to the sport. That might be something you want. So I'm talking about relative to your field of competition. If you need to get stronger, then the question is, what is holding you back right now? Is it your absolute strength? So is that is it, is it your squatting numbers, your deadlifting numbers, your pressing numbers, your pull-up numbers? Or is it your Olympic lifting numbers? Is it that you're really, really strong, but your snatch, your clean and jerk is a long way off relative to where your squat and your deadlift are? In which case, we need to focus on things like Olympic lifting technique. Is it your size? You know, we know looking at the averages of athletes, um, you know, generally speaking, what kind of height we need to be, although we can't change that, unfortunately. Um, but also, you know, your weight and your structure. Team athletes, you know, we are a lot of team athletes on this call and on our program. You know, there's a lot more variance in the team division. Um, you know, you can afford to be tall, very short, very heavy, very light, and still be able to compete. 
but when we're talking about individual competition, you know, we know that there is a mold, there is a structure that most elite athletes are at right now. So do we need to manipulate our size to bring ourselves more up to the average to help our strength? <clears throat> if you're someone who needs to work on their endurance, um, you know, decide, is it a muscle endurance limiter that you have, or is it an aerobic capacity limiter? Muscle endurance can be things like local muscle endurance, like your arms always blow out on chest bars. Your quads always blow out when you do wall balls. That might actually not be an, an aerobic capacity limiter or a cardiorespiratory limiter. It might actually just need to be, you need to do more high rep light squatting. You need to do more high rep light body weight pulling. If it's actually not a muscle endurance limiter and it's an aerobic capacity limiter, well then we probably got to be doing things like zone two, zone three, zone four, long, longer aerobic pieces at lower intensities and accumulating a lot more of that volume at this point in the season. And if it's technique, if you feel like your technique in something is poor and it's not necessarily an endurance limiter, it's not necessarily a strength limiter, well then re work on, you know, uh, identify what it is that's holding you back. Is it mobility? Is it you lacking shoulder flexion overhead that's stopping you moving through the rings in a bar muscle up or a ring muscle up? Or is it something through your hips and your ankles that's stopping you squatting deeper or having a more upright position for your snatch and your clean and jerk? If it's technique work, then maybe this is a great time of year to do a bit more isolated work. And how we do that on the program is if you see a movement that's programmed within a workout, let's say you've got a Metcon and your, your limiter is double unders and you want to work on refining double unders, but you see a workout that's three rounds of time, 100 double unders per round. Well, then this is where warm-ups and skill breakouts are really, really important for you. And this is what you need to self-guide, right? So rather than just jumping into a workout and not executing the movements in a workout, spend five, 10 minutes every time you see it on the menu and just work on it in a warm-up. Set up your phone, film it for your coach if you're on a premium subscription and get some feedback. Cool? Sick. Awesome. Okay, let's talk about very briefly what this next cycle looks like. Uh, this is going to be more for people who are not a part of the process. You haven't received all the updates that we just sent out today. Uh, this is more for people kind of outside looking in. We'll talk about the elite cycle first. So, you know, the goals of elite cycle are to, elite program are to prep people for the course finals, semifinals, and, and the open. Um, we are doing two sessions today. So we split it into AM and PM sessions. Each session is between 60 to 90 minutes long and we do five sessions a week so we generally prescribe rest days on thursdays and sundays our priorities this cycle is we're going to be really working on our snatch clean and jerk last cycle we've still been snatching clean and jerking but it hasn't been a priority we've been focusing more on driving up things like deadlift bench press squatting and pulling strength so now that we've de developed high levels of absolute strength we want to now see if we can express that with our strength speed movements which is just a fancy way of saying our olympic lifting so you're going to be doing Olympic lifting three times a week, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. We will still continue to work on our absolute squatting, uh, absolute strength within our squat, because it is a movement that I think our community is a little bit weak with. And it's a movement that gets tested a lot at the, at the higher end competitions. We're still going to be working on, on our strict gymnastics. Um, we're going to be working on higher skill gymnastics. And then we're definitely going to be doing some zone three aerobic capacity work. So kind of pulling back, on one session, the intensity a little bit. And we're going to be making sure we get some form of running in every week, at least once. Testing, we are going to test the Snatch 1RM, Clean and Jerk 1RM. And we have kind of like a gold standard test that we test every year. We'll be testing our strict handstand push-up capacity to see where our athletes are at. Moving on to our Compete program. So our Compete program is really catered towards, more towards athletes who are looking to peak at the quarterfinals or qualify to the quarterfinals. Why the semifinals is not here? Well, the semifinals, the amount of volume that's required for that, I think most athletes will need to be training with a bit more volume. That doesn't mean that you cannot make it to the semifinals following the complete program. We actually have had quite a few athletes last year make it, but it's one session a day, 60, 90 minutes per session and five sessions a week. You'll notice that the priorities are less on the complete program as well as the testing, uh, simply because they have less training opportunities within a week. Okay. This is an important slide, in my opinion, making adjustments to the program. Um, so what I think, whether you're someone who has a coach at the moment, or you follow another group program, or you're a part of the process, it's really important that we don't follow the program blindly. 
And what I mean by that is, you know, as a coaching team, we're always encouraging our athletes to make adjustments to the program based on what they think they need. Okay, so a few examples here. Number one, combining sessions. Not everyone uh, has the ability to train twice a day. Some people do, but some athletes aren't able to train twice a day every day. So if you are one of those athletes who thinks, okay, maybe you have a couple of days you can train twice a day and follow the program as it's prescribed, but you need to actually combine sessions, well then you should 100% do that. And the way that we would recommend doing that is kind of taking out the main priorities for the training sessions, making sure you do the main things that you need the most, and then maybe taking out the things that you don't need. Maybe it's not even about what you need and what you don't need, but it's actually what you feel like doing. So if you only have one opportunity to train in the day or you get less less sessions than normal and you're just thinking, I just don't feel like doing 30 ring muscle-ups today. Maybe even if I need them, but I'm just, my body's just not wanting it, then skip it out. All good. You know, add in the things that you feel like doing and you want to do. I think it's really important that our training has to be fun and enjoyable, especially at this time of the year. Of course, I've talked about it already. Um, you can add accessory programs to your training. What we'll often recommend is if you are adding accessory programs to your training, I would recommend replacing something within the program with the thing that you need. So rather than doing the program and then adding on an accessory program, which is quite a lot of volume, take something out and put something in. Okay. I'm always, I'm always an advocate for doing less. Um, and then if you feel like you're, if you're still making progressions, you're feeling great and you feel like you have more to give, then we can add more. But I think definitely adding more right from the start is never really a good solution. If you are short on time, like I said, just pick one of the sessions or combine the two sessions. If you follow the elite program normally, remember you could always look at the compete program. The compete program is just a 60 to 90 minute session. So if you feel like on that day, you just don't have the time availability to do the two sessions, simply switch over to the compete, compete program for that day. No problem at all. Most of the, the stimulus is often quite similar. This cycle will be a little bit different because Elite will be doing a lot more Olympic lifting, but you'll still get the same dose response. And of course, I know I keep on saying this, uh, but I really do think working for athletes who have goals as ambitious as yours, um, having a coach guide you through the process, this can be super, super valuable. Uh, CrossFit is a really hard sport. It's really, really painful. It can be very demoralizing sometimes. So knowing that you have someone along the ride with you, helping you, checking in on you, answering your questions, providing you the accountability and providing you with feedback, I think is uh, is really, really important at this level. <clears throat> How important is environment? I get asked this question all the time. And, you know, I'd love to actually kind of open this up to Ant to kind of share his two cents on this as well. Um, but I think environment at this level, the level that you guys are at is really, really important. And what I mean by environment, I mean trying to train with other people who might have similar goals to yourself or who are at the very least like-minded in the sense that they love the sport across and they're trying to get better every single day. Um, you know, there's tons of research that shows the benefits of training with other people um, in terms of like motivation, accountability, consistency with building habits. Uh, but at this level, I think a massive benefit of training with other people is just the constant learning effect. If you're training with other people, that other person or those other people might be better than you at a certain movement. And you get to watch them and see them do that movement all the time. There's a high likelihood that you're going to get better just by doing, being in that same room and watching them do it. Things like strategizing workouts, you know, doing workouts together, having the conversations about how did you attack this? How did you do it? Why did you do it? What would you change next time? Again, is all just feeding back into the learning loop, which is going to allow you to advance at a much, much faster rate. Uh, and I think, yeah, just shared suffering. I don't really like the word suffering because it implies that it's something really bad. Um, but I mean, like, this is a hard sport, right? It's a hard energy system sport. You're having to, you know, knuckle down and do very, very challenging things all the time, uh, very often. And being able to do that with other people just makes the process a little bit more enjoyable. <clears throat> so I do think, and I do encourage you guys to sometimes go off the program if that means that you have, the ability to train with someone else. So if you're someone who follows a program by yourself in the gym, you're doing it by yourself all the time. If you see a group of people, or maybe it's a group class, or maybe it's some friends doing a workout and you want to jump into that workout because it's going to give you that kind of the push, it's going to give you all the benefits we just talked about, but it's also going to give you the chance to compete, then I recommend doing it. And don't worry about going off script 
and not following the program for that session because sometimes I think it's really important that you've got to incorporate that into your training. What I would say is try to do that with sessions that are similar-ish to what you have planned for that week. So not necessarily that day. So for example, if you have, you know, you know that you struggle with Olympic lifting and that's something you want to improve on and a group of good athletes are next to you and they're about to do an Olympic lifting workout. Maybe it's a Metcon or doing some isolated stuff. Even if they're doing movements or rep schemes or complexes that are different to what you have on your program, at the end of the day, it's still snatching and it's still clean and jerking. And if that means that you apply a bit more intensity and a bit more focus into the session because you're doing it with others, then that's going to be a massive win for you. So just jump in and do it. Um, when to do it? Like I just said, like I really do this, especially with things that you struggle with. So if it's weightlifting, if it's strength, like if you struggle to get fired up, I know I certainly struggle to get fired up uh, when it comes to something heavy. So if I'm doing heavy stuff with other people, I'm always inclined to push a little bit harder. If it's Metcons, if you know you're someone who just sandbags the shit out of every workout when you're by yourself and you know that when you're racing people next to you, you tend to go a little bit harder, then make sure that every time you do your Metcons within the week, you're trying to do it with other people. What I will say is that we have the process community, which is slowly growing all over the world, which is really cool to see. And we do have people kind of like scattered across the globe. If you can try and team up once a week, twice a week, once a month with other people on the program, start to build those relationships and do workouts and training sessions together. I think that is so, so powerful and so valuable. And what I will just say before I hand this over to Ant to add anything is we are trying to cultivate a training community of people who are striving for these goals at Coastal Fitness. That's our affiliate where we all work every single day and where we kind of call our home. Um, so if you are based around Asia or anywhere in the world and you want to be a part of this training environment here, then we welcome you guys, open arms to come over to Hong Kong, spend some time with us, train with us and the crew and Ant and all the guys training the elite in the uh, in the PM sessions. And yeah, just, just you know, be a part of that that environment. Even if it's just for a weekend or just a week, or of course, if you want to permanently locate yourself over here, then we would we would love to have you. And over to you, anything to add? You're going to say you said everything, but... Yeah, you pretty much said everything. Um, no, I think, um, obviously, I think I have a fairly unique position as a, to a few people on this call in terms of being a coach at the process programming on the elite program and compete program, uh, as well as actually being a participant and an athlete on it. Uh, I think just going off what Ed said about trying to create an, a, a positive environment that helps lift you up. I mean, I've been in this sport for, I think, almost 10 years, about 10 years now. Um, I think I went through AM, PM sessions, just grinding it out solo. And, you know, it's uh, it's great for the mental side of things up to a certain point. And then often it can start to grind you to a bit of a halt and it can become demoralizing. You start questioning why you're doing it. And, like Ed said, if you can find someone around you who can help pick you up and create the environment that you are looking for, like-minded people, they don't have to be anywhere near as good as you. They might be better better than you, which is even better. Uh, but if they're not as good as you, but they love training with you, they just love training and love what you're doing, then grab them along and bring them along for the ride um, and get better at the same time together. I think one thing that we always talk about the process and something that's been a big part of my success and, and my journey over the last few years is trying to create intention with everything that you do within your training sessions and not just the individual training session. So for example, I just sent out a load of information about the next six week intensification cycle um, for the elite program. It's looking at that cycle, whether it's for five minutes or whether it's for 50 minutes and picking out what you really want to work on. What, what do you really need from that cycle? You know, Ed went through some weaknesses you might have identified in your own training sessions already. And, it's with everything that pops up, we only have a finite amount of time in every single day and session that we do to be able to improve. We only have a little bit of, um, you know, time that you can actually stay focused. Let's say it's about 60 to 90 minutes. Pick something that you want to try and win from that session and create a shitload of intention around it and create a win somehow from that. If you're going to, you know, edge the example of a double under, let's use a double crossover. I know I went through so many sessions of launching my rope against the wall, screaming fuck out of frustration about a thousand times. But then also looking back at my videos and then going back to YouTube and watching other videos, 
and then watching other people in the process who are damn good at it and then trying to learn from them and going back and applying that the next time versus being like, fuck those double unders and I'll do those again until hopefully it never show up in competition. And, you know, I put enough work into them that I can do a fair amount on broken now and they never came up in competition. But now I know that I can do it and it's going to be a skill that I continue to refine just like my double unders, just like my single unders, my speed steps and everything else. So try and create intention every time you go into a session especially when you feel like you're either a short in time or B, sometimes you feel like you're kind of, you're trying to dragging your feet and you don't really know what you're doing. You're just going along and going through the motions. That's when it's more important to come back to your why, remember why you're doing this and then create intention for that single piece that you're doing, whether it's A work, the B work or the C work. You should have an intention understanding of what you're doing for all three of them. Um, And that should help to prolong your journey in this sport um, I know there are a few familiar faces on this call that have been doing this sport for just as long as me, which is good to see, especially after I got called an old bastard when I was at semifinals this year. Um, but, you know, the goal is to have you guys doing this sport for as long as you want to, not because your body breaks down and your mind can no longer take it anymore. So, you know, find joy and find intention with every single thing that you guys do every time you put on your trainers to do a workout. Um, but I think it's just really cool to see so many of you on this call this time. I know last time it was pretty much myself, Ed, Izzy, and Skulk. So it's really good to see so many of you on this call, uh, and especially guys that I just saw very recently in Korea and the Philippines. Good to see you guys and uh, see you on the leaderboard. Nice, son. I think that's a perfect segue into our last slide for today. Oh, I don't know what's going on with this. Here we go. So on this last slide is this image here is actually something that, Ant, you tagged me in on Instagram the other day. Um, and I thought it was really good. I think there are actually more pieces that contribute to to this, but these this is a pretty good starting place. So this this post is the same, the 11, the 11 mental skills that make an athlete elite. I think everything we talked about so far in this call is really talking about the physical side, the training programs, you know, like uh, working on your weaknesses, how we structure the year. But I do think that, especially at the level that a lot of us on this call are at, so much of what constitutes the game day performance, but also what contributes to longevity in this sport um, comes down to like the mental aspect of it. And I think this applies to all sports. So kind of like this diagram just shows, um, you know, three three heads of the beast that need to be addressed and thought about. Number one, the fundamentals, motivation, confidence, and resilience. When we talk about interpersonal, we talk about relationships, really. Athlete, coach relationship, leadership, teamwork, and communication. And then we talk about self-regulation, which I, you guys will hear me talk about this till the sun goes down every single day, uh, but the importance of self-regulation. So having high levels of self-awareness, knowing how to manage stress, emotional arousal regulation, and intentional control. So we could talk about each of these bullet points in a ton of detail, and that could probably be a presentation itself. But I guess some pointers and things that I would love just to maybe leave as a takeaway message for you guys um, and I think that should be practices that high level athletes or people who want to be high level athletes should be doing all the time. Number one is record detailed notes on everything. So for those who are already a part of the process, you know, every time you guys have the opportunity to enter a score, you also have an opportunity to enter some thoughts. All right. So this is kind of like the notes or the comment section. And I don't recommend doing this because you need to do it for the other members to see or the other athletes to see, or to make your coach happy. You should be doing this as an opportunity to get your thoughts down on paper because you putting your thoughts down on paper is a fantastic way to start creating high levels of self-awareness. So what I mean by that, let's talk about a metabolic conditioning session, right? If you're just someone who shows up, does the workout, enters a score, then switches off and moves on, you are missing a unique opportunity of learning, right? Which is what we call kind of closing the feedback loop. Okay, so what we mean by that is that every time you do a metabolic conditioning session or a Metcon, let me keep it simple, is there's always an opportunity for learning. All right, so what was my strategy going into that workout? How was I feeling before the workout? How was I feeling in the middle of the workout? How did I feel at the end of the workout? What held me back in that workout? If I could do that workout again, what would I change and what would I do differently? And those are some just kind of like things that I will use to kind of structure my feedback. But if you imagine every single time you do a workout, 
you are taking yourself through that meticulous process of self-reflection. What happens next time you do that workout again? Or what happens next time you do a similar workout to that? You've now got this stored information, these stored memories and experiences to now pull from, which is now going to allow you to execute this workout better than the last time you did it. Right. And I do think this is such a massive missing ingredient in people who want to be good at the sport because they're just mindlessly doing the sport that we're just mindlessly training. And yes, you're still going to get better guys just by training without any self-reflection and self-awareness, you are going to get better. But there comes a point, especially with high level CrossFit where everyone can do the skills. Everyone's strong. Everyone has an aerobic capacity, but what is separating the people who always make it to the semis? What is separating the people who always make it to the games? What is separating the people who are always winning? And I honestly believe it's those extreme high levels of self-awareness. If you just even want to, want to put it back into talking about workouts, you know, the, 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 the athlete with high levels of self-awareness and experience can look at almost any workout and immediately know what breaking strategy they're going to use what pace they're going to hold, what type of mindset they need to be in and exactly how it's going to feel. Now, most of us are kind of just guessing, right? We're just like, oh, I kind of think it's going to be around this time per round. It's kind of going to feel like this. Not really sure how to break it. I'm just going to fuck it. I'm just going to do it and see what happens, right? And that's a separator. Now, if you are at that point, it doesn't mean you're going to be at that point forever. If you can start to just put a bit more time into the preparation, the reflection process of doing every single workout, which is exactly what Ant just said, it's intention, right? Having clear intentions behind every workout, that is going to facilitate a much, much faster learning curve. I'm a big believer in journaling, you know, whether journaling could be not just about your workout, because I guess, you know, reflecting at the end of a workout kind of is like a journal entry, but just having your own journals. You know, the athletes who are highly emotionally intelligent, you know, we call it EQ, but emotionally intelligent athletes are also the best athletes, in my opinion, because emotional intelligence has transferred into so many aspects of life. You know, it transfers into stress management. It transfers into things like holding trauma. It, it transfers into being a better communicator and therefore having more great relationships around you rather than toxic relationships and all of these noises, all these things around us that are not good are ultimately taken away from your ability to train, compete, and recover. And if your goal is to be the best athlete that you can be, then you want to minimize the noise. You want to minimize the stress that is taken away from your ability to do that, right? So I'm a massive advocate of journaling. If journaling is not your thing, make sure you have a group of people around you who you can trust and share openly with. So that means like you've got to be able to get your thoughts off your chest and share it with people. If you don't have those people, then journal. If you don't have those people and you don't journal, what happens with all the shit that we experience every single day? Not even in the training room, but just in everyday life. What happens? It gets stored up here or it gets swept under a rug inside us and it manifests and it comes becomes something so much bigger than it really was in the start. So I think that, you know, to be a great athlete, so many great athletes talk about the, the importance of having a team around them. This is where teams are super powerful right? Someone that you can just, you can offload on, you can talk, you can have deep conversations with. Surround yourself with like-minded people. I think this kind of comes back to what I said about environment, right? If every single day, whether you're in a training room or you're out of the training room, you're surrounded by people who want similar things to you, who have similar beliefs and values on life, then you are just setting yourself up for success. If you're surrounding yourself with people who don't want you want, you, who don't want what you want, or who don't want to support you in chasing after what you want, then this is going to be a really, really hard battle. Because we know at this level, guys, it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of emotional energy. And it's going to take a lot of investment to get you guys to be the best athletes you can be. And you need to surround yourself with people who also want that for you. I'm a massive believer that reading books, listening to podcasts and watching videos related to personal development. Again, this all comes back to EQ. It's not about CrossFit. I don't mean just watching a CrossFit journal. I don't mean just watching the road to the games or watching your favorite athletes vlog. I mean, do that shit as well. That's great because you, you learn about the sport and that's awesome. But I mean, developing yourself as a person. Again, it comes back to that emotional intelligence part. Emotionally intelligent, self-aware people are also great athletes. Um, daily check-ins that's something that we have embedded as a part of the process 
uh, you know, where every day when we do a workout or a workout is entered, we ask our athletes to do a quick self check-in, right? You know, what's your, what's your stress management like? What's your energy levels? What's your mental readiness? What's your physical readiness? All right. Even that simple checklist where you're scoring everything out of five and giving yourself a daily total only takes one minute, but just by going through that process allows you to start to pick up trends. So a lot of people, um, especially at this level, you, you guys will have just days or weeks where you're just like, oh, I'm just having a shit day. Oh, I'm just having a shit week. Oh, just everything felt heavy today. Oh, I just couldn't execute anything well. But I always think, it's, I'll always challenge someone when they say that to say, well, why? Like we need to be good at connecting the dots in what's happened previously, which has contributed to why we are how we are right now, right? It's not good enough just to say I'm having a bad day. Like you guys need to be so self-aware that you know exactly why. And this is what a daily check-in can do is it allows you to connect the dots and allows you to pick up on trends and basically forecast when you're going to have one of these bad days ahead of time. And hopefully you can you can nip it at the bud and you can change things before that bad day actually arrives. <clears throat> if you don't like sharing a daily check-in on something like our leaderboard because you feel like it's something more private, totally understand, you know, create your own check-in system where it's private to you. Maybe it's in a notebook. It's however you like to keep track of your life. Do it there. And of course, I'm just going to say it's the last time. I know I'm much realizing now this is starting to sound like I'm hard selling our premium program. Definitely not doing that. You know, I wouldn't push the heart, the premium program to everyone, but I'm pushing it to you guys because I do think that having someone guide you along the process with the goals that you guys are after and the pain that you guys are putting yourselves through every single day could be um, could be really beneficial. Cool. Well, that takes us pretty much up into the hour mark, five minutes over. Um, that's everything I had planned for today, guys. And there is a closing slide, but it's frozen now, but that's okay. Um, what I wanted to finish with was firstly by saying thank you to everyone for joining. Um, and, you know, if anyone has any questions or thoughts um, or things related to them, uh, and, you know, you and your own training that you'd love to kind of pick our brains on and use opportunity, uh, I would love for you guys to ask it. In fact, before we do that, guys, can we all just turn on our videos and just give me a big smile for a photo, please? Because I always forget to do this. Come on, Al. Come on, Florence. Come on, Tony San. Yes, yeah, Sal. Ladies. We're almost there. Come on, Landy. I'm waiting for you. Yes, good mustache, Tony San. Come on, Zoo. Last one. Okay, guys. Ready? One, two, three. Legends. Okay, listen. If you don't feel comfortable asking questions, you definitely don't need to, but I do want to just open this up um for anyone who does have anything they'd like to ask I'm just going to turn on my light because i've turned into an orange did i i did i just crush that presentation so much that there literally is no questions can i ask a question yes al okay um, I don't know if this is for me personally or other people, but I feel like one thing that I really struggled with last year in the quarterfinals was lifting under fatigue. Um, I know that like me, I'm not the strongest person anyway. So the lifting was hard enough for me, but that 275 bar, I, I know I can clean and jerk that no problem. But I found that when my legs were tired, I found it very difficult. Um, one thing that I was wondering if it will come up in the programming closer towards quarterfinals next year is more sort of heavier lifting within workouts where we're not just isolating the strength bit. Because I know we do a lot of that in the accumulation phases, like what we've just done now. And that has helped me massively, but I found, I just want to make sure that again, I'm not sure if it's too personal to me or not, but when I get round to the quarterfinals again, I don't just lose all of my strength gains because we go back into, um, not the accumulation phase, the other one, whatever you call it, intensification, where I just get really fit again and I lose all my strength. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question. I don't think it's actually one that's personal to you. I think that, that applies to everyone on this call. Um, yeah, for sure. We are going to be... So let's even just talk about where we are right now, Al. You know, we've just gone through a phase of isolating a lot of our Olympic lifting, but it hasn't even been a priority, right? We've just been kind of 
we just been yeah. touching on Olympic lifting in the last cycle, focusing more on developing squatting strength, hinging strength. This cycle now, we will isolate our Olympic lifting more and try to improve our, our snatch cleaning jet 1RMs. In the next cycle after this, once we've then you look back, we developed good levels of absolute strength. We develop good levels of absolute speed strength. Then we're going to do more fatigue-based lifting in the cycle after this one. And then rolling into the season, something we'll definitely do more of this year. We did it last, we did it this year, but we don't think we did it for long enough was doing us, even just doing our strength work after conditioning work. I think, you know, we bias a lot of our training in the year where we go strength first, conditioning second, or we do strength conditioning as separate sessions, but actually yeah. going Metcon and then lift as in like do a whole lifting session. Like it's a training session is a really good way to bridge us into a phase where we're doing lifting under fatigue as well. So we're kind of, in, yeah. we want to incorporate all those elements together. So to answer your question, yes, Al, we will definitely do that. Um, but I think we also need to understand that right now, I know this wasn't your question, but I'll say it anyway, that, you know, doing very like heavy lifting in an aerobically fatigue based setting is a very stressful thing on the nervous system. So we've got to be careful about how much we dose in the year. So this year, right now, we won't do too much of it, but we definitely will a little bit later. Yeah, I don't feel like I'm in any rush to do that cons again. I quite like just doing all the strength stuff. And I feel like I'm I'm not anywhere near as unfit as I have been when I've only done a strength cycle before. Um, I've liked how the conditioning has been more like zone two and easier workouts this time because it's allowed me to get a lot stronger without feeling like I'm just incredibly unfit. So even when we have had Metcons, like I still feel like I'm doing good in them but they just feel harder than normal not that i'm doing terrible and they feel terrible at the same time yeah so yeah that's good 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 things to feel yeah so in, in this next cycle i think probably expect to not see such a drastic increase in your strength but we would definitely want to see our Olympic lifting numbers come up at the very least we've got to maintain the strength we just built in the last 12 weeks i do think we'll still increase it because we'll still be squatting twice a week uh, but we will be doing in this next six weeks a lot more kind of crossfitty metcon so you'll probably yeah. feel that side of thing bump up a bit now and then in our next cycle we're going to push it back the other way a bit yeah yeah because i said to Ant the other day as well that i'm looking forward to doing clean and jerks because we've done so many squats and a lot of positional stuff on the front squats that and we haven't pushed them for like three months so i'm excited to see what i can hit on those awesome awesome that's the idea thank you al good question um i had a question Yes, Annie. Thank you for joining Hi. us, by the way. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if y'all had any advice. I'm sure there's no fixed answer for this, but like I just because I, I recently changed jobs to be to be a coach at, at our CrossFit gym this year. So I don't know. On one hand, I thought like I'd be in the gym more and it would be slightly easier, but I'm finding it just hard to battle that fatigue of just being in the gym all day and, and I think scheduling PTs and managing coaching, uh managing coaching as well as my training just wondering what advice y'all had for yeah for that i love that and i'm gonna let you answer this one okay um yeah i can massively relate as i'm sure a lot of the people almost all the people on this call call probably can um i think obviously first thing to note is that yes i think a coach has got a pretty anti-social life firstly uh it's a the social this service industry that we've chosen to put ourselves into is not the uh, kindest in terms of timings um so yes first things first is you can you got to manage what you can which is your sleep time and your sleep quality and quantity as much as possible so you got to really prioritize that that's number one thing i think the next thing is when you're in a gym especially a gym like uh casino casino coastal where there's no windows uh, it is super important to, to get outside and to give yourself a break, not only from just like the lights above you and the noise, it's just to stop and stop having people ask you a million questions and stop having to connect with people. Just basically give yourself 20 minutes, you know, I think, and you, I think we all know how much Ed loves the sun and 20 mad and all that sort of stuff. But honestly, the main the main thing is to take yourself out from that high pressure, high intensity environment of banging music, banging barbells, screaming people, and high fiving. Give yourself a second to to rezone in on what you need to do. You know whether that is going to training, or whether that is you going to a meeting, or you even going to dinner or lunch, whatever it might be. 
take yourself away from the environment before you put yourself back into it. And often, often for sure, you will actually find that you take yourself away from the environment. You go, shit, I actually don't have what it takes to do this session today. Maybe I need to modify it. And that's the self-regulation side of thing that Ed was talking about before. And that's not a problem, you know, especially if you are, you know, if you'll just move to a full-time gig with coaching now, often we screwed up and we put like four to six hours back to back to back to back. And you're like, why have I done that? I never, I'm never going to do that again, but it's just a learning curve and you, you will figure out a schedule which works for you for sure, which will allow you to do your AM and PM if that's what you're doing, or at least give you a two hour window where you're uninterrupted. Um, one thing that I've definitely started doing is like I turn my phone off so I don't get any notifications or anything. Cause I also wear an Apple watch cause it's very important that I win the step game. Um, out of everyone every single day and record all my calories but i also don't want my watch buzzing when i'm in a workout my phone is only there to record my videos and to re-watch the videos and until the session is done then i'll look at my phone afterwards um like i said make sure that you if if exercise in your training is something that is that important to you that you give yourself the required time to complete your session to your fullest and best ability so if you know i need a minimum of 120 minutes two hours to smash this session you have to give yourself a minimum of probably two hours, 15 minutes to be able to do your pre-workout and post-workout stuff, plus the, all the work in the middle. And that should be like a non-negotiable for you. Just like the hour you working with a class or a client is, you have to be selfish, selfish, but also selfless enough to be able to do that for yourself, to give yourself that time to train. Um, yeah, again, I think going back to the self-regulation thing, it's, it's don't be afraid to take a break or miss a session if you do miss a session. It's totally fine. You can make it up at another point, or you pick and choose the things you need to do. Like Ed said, maybe you do flick over to the compete stuff and just go, all right, well, I know I want to do legless rope climbs, and I want to do this. So just stitch those things together and move on with the day. That's totally fine. Note it down in your journal or note it down on your comments, and you can see that next week. And when you come back to the Wednesday session, okay, I booked six clients back-to-back. -back. Now I'm just going to push that back to four. I'm going to split it as a three and three to give myself more time. Um, but yes, it's hard. Of course, things that can help you, um, Quran, I'm sure will, uh, back me up on this is, uh, stimulants, things like caffeine, that sort of thing, totally fine to take as long as it is not going to interrupt with your sleep and the rest of your work day. If it's enough to push you up for your training and get you fired up to do that sort of stuff, that's totally fine, but don't go smashing five monsters in a double espresso in, you know, at 4 PM before you're doing a PM session. Um, try and control that as best you can but use it you know to your advantage for sure um i know i'm yeah i think i think that's probably honestly all for me i think the next thing the last thing would just be eating and nutrition um make you know that that's a hard one and it's of course massively individualized i know everyone probably has their own routine here so i know for me i will always make sure that i have at least a meal that i normally have for my pm session I've done it in the past where I like just completely forget about it and I end just smashing back protein shakes and that doesn't work for me. And, it, and if it does, it lasts about two to three weeks before I start to crash and burn. Um, so yeah, I think for me, number one is sleep. Number two, remove yourself from the environment before you put yourself back into it. And number three, your nutrition and uh, food. Uh, Ed, anything to add on that? Yeah, I, mean, I think those are all really good points. And I also want to say, Annie, I've heard some really good feedback from you as a coach. So good job transitioning into the industry. Um, I would say that, um, you know, the more fixed your schedule can be, could be a really better, a real benefit, right? So as much as you can try and have each day looking the same. Uh, of course, if, if clients are changing um, last minute, then sometimes you've got to do that. But you just got to block in the time which is important to you. So, you know, I encourage all of our coaches to actually put into their journals, their diaries, um, when their training time is and those are non-negotiable times um, and as much as you can don't allow your clients or your work schedule to interfere with your own because then you're kind of just always abandoning yourself and you'll be frustrated yourself forever second thing is I think this applies to everyone not just coaches is I kind of look at training as like a bit of a jigsaw right so if you have certain days which you know are easier days in terms of work or days where you just always feel better. Like for example, a Friday might be the day where you have less clients or you've got less work to do. And it's always when your energy feels best. You just come out of rest day. What I would say then is look at the whole week and put the most challenging workouts 
that are going to demand the most amount of energy from you into that Friday and just slide the rest of the workouts around so that you get the most out of it. For example, if snatching is always is your the thing you want to work on the most, and it's always on the day when you have a really, really busy work day, and therefore you feel like you've got no energy to give to it, then you're not setting yourself up for success. Instead, maybe slide like the zone two, zone three aerobic session, which like doesn't really take much warming up for, you can pretty much get into it straight away. Maybe you slide that into that training session and you move your snatching to a day where you're going to feel best because you got less work. You know, you can sleep in a little bit later. You know, you can eat a bigger breakfast, whatever the reasons. Like I really encourage you guys to do that. I, I actually do that with the compete program all the time. I'm always just kind of sliding the sessions around and like kind of cutting the sessions in half and just moving them around based on the time I have to give in a day or how much energy I have to give in a day. Zen, does that help, Annie? Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much, guys. Awesome. Good. good question. Is that why you still haven't done your squat test? Ed. <laughs> oh, me? Yeah, you. Um, any more questions? <laughs> any more questions? <laughs> I will get it done, Anna, I promise you. That's right. It's on your shoulders, not mine. Yeah, I know. It's going to be a lot of weight as well. <laughs> okay. All good, guys? Okay, well, listen, In the uh, if you guys leave us a call and a question pops into your head, um, and if you're not part of the process and you would love to ask it, please, please reach out to any of us um, on social media or if you're on a part of the process on WhatsApp. If you just have questions about the program, um, and you know, whether you think it's going to be a good fit for you, you know, I'm definitely not pushing everyone to be a part of it. Like it needs to be the right fit for you and what you want. Um, but you know, I would love to have a conversation. Uh, but thank you everyone for tuning in. Appreciate it. Um, hope you guys all have a lovely evening and I'm looking forward to catching up with you all soon at some point. See you guys. Thank you. Thanks. Bye guys. Bye guys. Bye guys. See you later. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.